and welcome to an introduction to the mammals of the Dales. This is quite a lengthy presentation so please feel free to pause and uh, come back to it at any point in time. Um, but what we're going to do is take a broad overview of uh, the mammals uh, as a whole group but also focus more on the particular species that you're likely to find in our local area. If we start at the beginning in the kingdom of Animalia, mammals are part of the phylum chordata in that they have a dorsal nerve cord, or, or at least have one at some point in their development. There are over 20 orders of mammalia, and scientists don't seem to be able to agree on the exact number, but they are divided into three subclasses. So those three subclasses are eutheria, and those are the placental mammal groups, uh, as in those that produce young using a placenta. Um, it's the largest of the subclasses, and all of our UK species fall into this subclass. If we go on to metatheria, these are the marsupials, so those are the ones that breed with pouches. There's actually 270 species of those worldwide. Whereas the prototheria, which are the egg layers, we've only got two families worldwide. In the eutheria group, we have got nine families that we find in the UK. Um, they are all part of the subclass eutheria, as we've already said. And what this PowerPoint is going to do is go through each of those families. Um, and as I said before, we'll focus on the locally found species. Before we look at that, just a bit of background on uh, the, the mammal species. In and around the British Isles, we've got about 107 species. So 28 of those are native terrestrial and two are marine mammals. 18 of those are bats. Five are actually island specific species. So they're only found on the, the UK islands. 30 are cetaceans, so um, our dolphins and whales. Nine are vagrants, so that is species that we know are, uh, are found occasionally, so um, bats um, or cetacean species. Thirteen are introduced or naturalised, and three of these are classed as invasive species. And when we say that, we mean that they're seen to cause damage um, to our biodiversity or to the habitats that certain animals need, um, and their presence has a negative impact on our native wildlife. So this can actually not just affect the native biodiversity, but our economy as well. So on average, this country spends 1.7 billion a year on the management of various invasive species. There are very specific laws around the rescue and release of invasive species. The Mammal Society class 47 of these as native or formerly native in the UK and if we scale that down um, in England we've got 45 native or formerly native species. Um, the state of our mammal population is something of some concern. In the most recent State of Nature report mammals appear to have relatively stable abundance figures since 1994 but the average distribution has decreased by 26%. Um, you can find out more about this either from the Mammal Society, um, from which these diagrams have been taken, um, and also the People's Trust for Endangered Species have got a lot of information on, on the state of um, various species in this country. If we look at our first family, we've got the artodactyla or the deer. Um, I say the deer, it also includes um, the wild boar. But if we look at the deer first, we've got six species that you're likely to find in this country. Of the six species, there are two that you are unlikely to ever see in this part of the country. So um, they are the monk jack deer, 
which is prevalent in the uh, the south and has spread into Wales, but they are moving north. So that is um, the the top left picture that you can see there, the monk jack deer. And Chinese water deer, which is the bottom right picture, um, and they are predominantly found in the southeast. Although the monk jack is considered a UK invasive, um, the Chinese water deer is actually listed as vulnerable on the international red list. So the monk jack was introduced around 1930 to Woburn um, and the Chinese water deer introduced also around this time and to Whipsnade and Woburn. All of the populations that we've got that have established have originated from uh, escapees from those private collections. In North Yorkshire, we have managed herds of deer in local parks such as Fountains Abbey and Studley Royal Deer Park. So here you have got the most likelihood of seeing red deer, which is our largest terrestrial mammal. It's native, although the population stronghold is Scotland. Um, they are very impressive animals and you're unlikely to mistake them for any of the other deer species, particularly um, when you've got one of the, the male deer, um, the stags, um, showing full antlers. Another one is the fallow deer. Again, can be seen um, in managed populations in our, our local parks. Um, they are introduced, were introduced by the Normans. Uh, they're now very widespread. They're typically recognised by the tan coat with white spots on them. Um, but you can also get um, a lot of variation in the coat colour. So they can vary from a very light coloured coat to a very dark coloured coat. And you also get uh, melanic uh, individuals, which are pretty much black. Um, they're also known to present albino as well. One of the most common colour coats that actually you find in the UK is this dark brown colouring Um and, and that is actually quite typical of, of most of the wild or mainly wild populations within this uh, country now. The last one is the seeker deer. Um, again, part of um, private collections in this area. Um, they were introduced from Japan and Taiwan um, during the 19, uh, 1860s to private collections. Um, their colouring is often similar to the fallow deer, but they typically go a much darker brown colour in the winter. The species of deer that we've got a really good local population of here is the roe deer. So it's the second native species of the six that you find in this country. It's widespread across the dales. Um, it likes a mixture of woodland and grassland or moorland and it favours deciduous woodland with clearings. If we just have a look at the colouring, the colouring quite often varies from uh, a sandy red colour in the summer um, going to a more sort of greyish brown colour in the winter um, and it has a, a white patch on its rear. Um, the tail is actually more of a tuft and it is not necessarily that obvious or very easy to see at all. Um, in the females this tends to be an inverted heart shape uh, section in the coat colouring uh, with a little tush at the base um, which which can be mistaken for the, the tail whereas the male tends to have a more kidney shape to this patch. Um, they've got a very typical black nose with a white chin um, and the bark that you can see in this picture here has got quite a small pair of antlers. They're usually about 25 centimetres in length and here is a picture of the doe. So good places to see roe deer would be uh, up at Malantan. Uh, Swarthmore at Harewith Bridge and Oxenberg Wood and that is between Faser and Oswick. Um, despite its current distribution, by the 18th century it was actually limited to the Scottish Highlands due to persecution and reforestation. Since then it's been able to uh, spread and regain some territory. In terms of breeding, 
Uh, the Buck's antlers are dropped or cast in the November or December of each year. Those antlers then begin to grow again. The rut is between July and August. Um, the courtship between the buck and the roe tends to be more of a sort of endurance chase of the buck um, in that he will follow the doe around um, until she is ready um, to 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 breed. The roe deer do tend to be solitary, um, although they may form smaller groups in, in winter. They do actually practice something called delayed implantation. And what we mean by that is that they will mate in the July and the August, um, but the fertilised egg only implants and starts growing in the January um, of the following year. Um, and that then leads to the birth of two or three kids, uh, which are born May and June. And so that is almost a year after um, the rut actually takes place and, and courtship has taken place. One of the main identification tools in terms of deer is the identification of rumps. Um, each of the species has got quite a distinctive uh, rump and what is quite helpful is that the deer are often running away from you. So this is quite a good point of reference um, to have a look at and to practice. Um, this set of diagrams is actually available as handout, um, so you're more than welcome to download that um, and write on it. You can pause this and have a go at guessing what they are if you want to, and then what we're going to do is go through the answers in the next slide. So, answers wise, the first of our diagrams, uh, so that is the top left, is a roe deer. So in this picture you can see um, the little tuft that we were talking about in terms of um, the female presentation of this white rump. The tail, very much just a tuft um, and not particularly obvious at all. So a heart or kidney shaped white patch um, on the rear of the deer is a roe deer. Our second one is the Chinese water deer. So that has little colour variation uh, on the rump and the tail is short and slim. Third one is a monk jack deer and the monk jack has got a lighter colour underneath the tail and the tail is short and wide. When it is alarmed, the monk jack deer tail goes up and you see that lighter colour. So it's almost like running along with a big white flag, um, raising the alarm to any other monk jack that are within the area as well. Number four is a red deer. So we've got more of a creamy coloured patch uh, uh, on the rump of the red deer rather than a white coloured patch. Uh, the tail is brown, it's reasonably short but it looks even shorter because the tail fur tends to get lighter as you go down the um, tail itself. The fifth diagram we've got here is of a seeker deer. So you've got a white patch um, which has got quite an obvious black surround to it. The tail is small and not particularly obvious. And this rump is very, very similar to the fallow deer, which also has a very defined black marking around the white rump area. The difference is that the tail is quite long on the fallow deer and this black marking goes down the centre of the tail as well. The last one of this particular family is the wild boar and the wild boar was hunted to extinction by the 15th century, although it's extinct in this country, it's still quite common in uh, particular areas of Europe. Um, it's actually thought that the foraging method um, that the boar use with their snouts is actually quite a key way to maintain the health of a woodland. Um, somebody I know who teaches woodland management would say that if they had their own woodland, they would eliminate any deer 
um, and keep them out um, that they had within that woodland and they would keep pigs or boar within it and that snuffling motion that they use um, is quite key in just mixing things around, helping seeds uh, germinate and and keeping that woodland area at the base disturbed and it, it means that you get quite a good difference in terms of um, the different layers of your woodland. So rather than just having a lot of well-established trees with the canopy, the disruption to that area means that you've got lots of different areas um, of of shrub growth, you will have areas of vegetation and then you'll have um, newly establishing trees and all in all it just gives you a better woodland habitat. Populations in this country of the wild boar are now uh, localised and they are introduced. We're known uh, to have three breeding populations and those are in Dorset, in the Forest of Dean and on the Kent and Sussex border. Now, because boar will readily breed with the domestic pigs and then hybridise, um, we've got a situation whereby the genetic identity of the populations that we've got in the UK at the moment are, in fact, uncertain. Our next family is carnivora, so that's the cats, dogs and the mustelids. And of the species that we find in this country, we're just going to go into a little bit more detail about the ones found within the dales. And those are the fox, the stoat, the weasel, badger and the otter. It's unlikely that you would ever get a sighting of a wild cat anyway. So they are legally protected and the population is restricted to Scotland. Um, the most major threat to the wild cat population now is actually genetics. So because they will breed and hybridise with feral cats or domestic cats that now live independently of people, um, it means that they're not entirely sure about the wild cat population they know they have, how many are truly genetically wild cats rather than hybrids. It's an estimated uh, population of 1.5 million feral cats in the country, whereas the estimate is as few as 400 to 1,000 for the wild cat. Um, another one that we don't often get around here is the polecat. So it's one of the most difficult mammals to see in Britain. And that's predominantly because it is so sensitive, in, uh, so secretive in, in its habits. Um, it was restricted to the Wales area and to the Midlands, but it is now expanding its range. It's still legally protected. Um, and you may also come across domesticated polecats or ferrets um, and ferrets are capable of becoming feral so we do have a feral population of ferrets in this country. Another one that we're not going to focus too much on is the American mink which was introduced after being kept in fair farms in the mid 20th century. Um, they either escaped um, or were actually frequently released as part of protests against fur farms. Um, they're fairly common and we do get them in this area. Um, they're widespread now and recognised as an invasive species because of their detrimental effect on our native uh, wildlife, namely the water vole. Um, they're very good swimmers, often seen by water. Um, and do predate very heavily on the water well. They're also a slightly smaller size than the otter, which means that they can actually hunt and follow the water well into their burrows, which is something that the otter is not capable of. The last one that we're not going to worry too much about um, is the pine martin. Um, pine martins are ready climbers um, of trees, which is unlike their other near relatives um, of the muscular group. Um, it was widespread, but it's now mainly confined to Scotland and Ireland. And although it's starting to return to its former range, um, the population in England and Wales is thought to be fewer than 100. Um, it is protected and there are reintroduction programmes in place. So, the fox. Easily recognisable and a, a distinctive animal. Um, it's the size of a small to a medium dog and most people know 
instantly what a fox looks like. In rural areas, they tend to be quite skittish um, and avoid human contact as, as much as possible. In this area, foxes do tend to still be persecuted. Um, and interestingly, Yorkshire ranks as one of the top spots in the country for the suspected illegal hunting practices, um, those that would include the hunting of foxes, hares, deer, badger, and also um, raptors. But locally, you're more likely to find signs of a fox than to actually see a fox. Um, it's quite likely that in our area they would um, use the shelter that they would find of the, the railway system to travel along from, from place to place. Um, its dens are likely to be in small woodland areas where there's more cover um, and where they're likely to be disturbed less and less likely to come in contact with humans. Urban foxes, on the other hand, have become quite a lot less nervous of humans. Um, they quite often interact with each other more and they thrive on the scraps of food that they scavenge in, in their, their home ranges uh, rather than hunting on uh, birds, voles and rabbits uh, as your rural foxes would. Rural foxes are much less densely populated so typically you would get one to two foxes per kilometre squared um, and that can be up to 10 in more urban areas. Foxes tend to be either nocturnal or crepuscular, by which we mean that they are active um, at dusk and dawn. They do tend to be territorial um, and a meeting between foxes often doesn't end particularly well. Next we've got the stoat, um, quite a feisty little beast. Um, it's often seen on road edges, um, quite typically if you're driving. Um, they make good use of the shelter that our dry stone walls provide um, and they quite often use those dry stone walls as travelling paths as they sort of nip in and out of all the crevices between um, the, the rocks. Um, it's quite common. It's very hardy and it copes well with the cold that we get in our area in the winter. Uh, we are far enough uh, into its northern range here in the Dales to regularly see stoats in the winter that have molted to an all white coat um, and they're still distinguishable by the black tip to the tail which remains even if they have that white coat in the winter. Typically, the coat is a chestnut brown colour uh, with quite a neat dividing line between the brown, uh, the main brown of the coat and the white colour of its belly. As I said before, they're ferocious predators and they often take down prey much, much larger than themselves. Although it's typically larger than the weasel, there is some overlap in the size of the female state and the male weasel. So they're, they're quite substantially bigger than males of both the the stoat and the weasel than the female. Um, they are exclusively predators um, and they're just very adept at, at, at killing things essentially. Uh, they're excellent uh, climbers, they'll make use of a really wide range of habitats, um, they're rarely heard um, and they're very very good at giving chase to animals and bringing down prey that is as I said, much, much larger than themselves. Um, typically around here, if you hear a rabbit screaming, then it's probably because of a stoat um, chasing it. Um, and they will take down their prey, give them a, a very sharp bite to the back of the neck in order to subdue and kill them. The weasel is, is very similar to the stoat. So it is smaller in size, but as I said before, there is a slight bit of overlap. Um, they tend to be more orangey brown in colour, but the the main differences between the two are that you have quite a wiggly line between the uh, brown colour, main colour of the coat and the white belly fur, um, and you don't have any tip, black tip to the tail. This has given rise to the saying, uh, wiggly weasel and straight stoat. So as we said before, the stoat has got quite a straight 
clean line between the brown fur and the white belly fur um, and it is a very wiggly line in between uh, the, the two fur colourings on the weasel. So wiggly weasel, straight stoat. Again, similarly to this stoat, the weasel is exclusively carnivorous. So it predates on mainly voles and other small mammals and, and also other smaller birds. But it's not completely unheard of for a weasel to take down a smaller rabbit as well. They are much more subtle in their behaviour, so they're seen by us much left, less often than the stoat is, but they do occupy similar habitats. They don't display white colour in winter, even in the northern area of their territory. Um, and whereas the stoat will delay implantation of fertilised embryos, the weasel doesn't do this. They are both active all year round, day or night. And interestingly, the weasel is the world's smallest member of the carnivora family. Next, we've got the badger. Um, and despite being persecuted for century, uh, which has led to their protective status, they are actually still common. It's thought that it owes a lot of its survival to its natural inclination to be wary and secretive. Um, it is also predominantly nocturnal, spends the day sleeping in its uh, large underground sets. They are very, very recognisable in appearance with very powerful front legs um, and they've got very large claws. Excellent diggers because of this. Although they're more typically seen as, as black, white and grey, they can actually vary in their colouring. Um, and some individuals are more brown in colour, um, so they can also be found as albino. Um, they can be found as melanistic individuals, which means that they are black. Um, and also something called um, erythristic uh, um, individuals, which tend to be more of a reddish colour. They prefer a mix of woodland and the pasture area, so they tend to build their sets under the cover of, of, of a woodland um, and then they prefer the, the pasture open areas uh, for feeding and scavenging for their food. And they do have quite a broad diet, although they mainly feed on earthworms. Um, badgers are also known to predate on hedgehogs and um, it's quite a, a typical a way in which they they leave their the remains of a dead hedgehog that that mean that you instantly would know it was um, a badger in that they have learned to scoop the hedgehog out of its skin um, with those really really large claws and paws. Um, it, it means that what you would then find is just an inside out skin uh, of a hedgehog left behind. Um, so I'm sorry if that's a little bit gory for you. Um, it does, interestingly, just seem to be some some groups that will do this, whereas others don't. So it almost seems to be a, a learnt family skill that individuals of the family will pass on to other family individuals, whereas other groups won't actually do this at all. They are very social within their family groups um, and they have very strong territory bound boundaries between the sets. They don't hibernate, but they do become much less active in the winter. Um, and they also practice delayed implantation. So although mating can occur any time, um, the embryo, fertilised embryo would be implanted in the December and cubs would be born June to March. And we would usually expect about five cubs per litter. Many badgers are killed on the road and despite being protected, there was a government funded campaign of culling in an attempt, um, a failed attempt to control bovine TB. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. And, and what they've opted for is a more successful method of, um, of vaccinating. So there is a vaccination program in place instead. On to the otter. Um, and otters are protected. They are widespread and common. Um, you would probably know what an otter looks like. Um, 
in terms of seeing it as a picture, but sometimes it's not all that identifiable or instantly obvious in the water. Um, you quite often only see the head of the otter when it's swimming in the water. It is quite a long bodied animal with a tapering tail. It's brown, um, predominantly uniformly brown with just a slightly paler throat and upper belly. Um, it tends to be about 60 to 90 centimetres in length and the tail can add up to 50 centimetres to that. Um, and they can actually weigh up to 17 kilograms. Much of the otter's decline was due to water quality and um, particularly the pollution from organic pesticides and polychlorinated uh, biphenyls. Uh, both of those are accumulating in the food chain. After the improvement of water quality, the population has uh, gradually recovered um, and it has been aided in some part by reintroductory schemes. Um, the otter is very able in its swimming and it spends most of its time in and around a water. They are very playful despite typically being solitary and they usually stay quite close to the water having home ranges of about 7 to 15 kilometres that always sort of radiate out from their main body of water. Um, Territories can overlap. Uh, any males, territories that overlap, if those males meet, then they, they will fight quite ferociously. Whereas females will often share a communal range um, and there, there could be several halts within that range. So just because you've got a halt doesn't mean that that is the only place that that otter will come and use uh, to sleep in or to raise its cubs. It does tend to have its halts in quite a wide range of places. So it doesn't usually dig its own area or, or hole and it quite often just makes use of places. So things like disused rabbit holes, um, very dense areas of vegetation, hollowed out tree trunks. Um, essentially it's, it's quite innovative in its its use of areas that it can uh, hunker down in. Um, the otters do tend to have areas that they like to feed on and they are also, particularly at the edges of their territory, tend to regularly sprint in that area as a, as a marker to that territory. Otters can breed at any time, um, but here in the north it does tend to be seasonal and that's just to hopefully ensure that the uh, cubs are born in the summer um, and it gives them more chance of survival so they can be born in the summer when food is plentiful and the temperatures are okay um, and build up their fat reserves before the winter. Litters are usually of two to three cubs. They're raised solely by the mother and they will stay with her for about a year. They can actually cover quite a large area um, over land. So say if they needed to find a new territory, an unoccupied territory, um, then they will travel quite long distances over land. Um, this means that they are vulnerable to road collisions. Um, they are also still affected by pollution and development. What's interesting though is that um, they can often be confused with sea otters because they will also make use of coastal areas and it's the what is I find more interesting is that coastal animals tend to be diurnal so they're more active during the day whereas the um, river dwelling otters or the, the more inland and freshwater otters tend to be nocturnal so you would be more likely in our area to see an otter early in the morning or later in the evening. It will probably be no great surprise to you that Cetacea is not particularly well represented in the Yorkshire Dales. But if we were to head over to the North Yorkshire coast, so Whitby Way, you might well get a sighting of either a minke whale, a bottlenose dolphin, the white beak dolphin or the harbour porpoise. The minke whale is legally protected, can reach a length of about 10 metres and it's the only whale that you're likely to see from the land. 
uh, as in on the coastline in Britain and in Ireland. They seem to prefer shallower water, which possibly explains that, um, and they are known to make use of estuaries. They are usually most commonly seen between May and September, and it's not actually a very sociable whale either. So if you see more than one individual, it's likely to be a mother and her calf. The bottlenose dolphin, also legally protected, is an inshore and offshore resident. It is active throughout the year and can reach about four metres in length. It's described a little bit sad really as a large robust and somewhat plain dolphin uh, but it does have a distinct sickle shaped dorsal fin. The white beak dolphin is actually the main resonant dolphin in the North Yorkshire area coastline. It can reach up to three meters in length. It's identifiable because of its um, sooty black colour and then it's got a lighter area um, sometimes referred to as a saddle behind its dorsal fin. Although it's visible throughout the year you're most likely to see it between June and September um, and it is also legally protected. The harbour porpoise again legally protected is the smallest cetacean which we find in the British and Irish waters. It is easily identifiable because of its small size um, and also because it's got a small, blunt and triangular dorsal fin. It will only reach about 1.7 metres in length, is often seen in groups of about six individuals and it is tends to be quite shy in its behaviour, so by which I mean it will um, actively avoid vessels. This link list is not exclusive um, you will with all coastal animals often get occasional sightings where you wouldn't necessarily expect to and this can be due to storms uh, them being in search of food outside of their regular hunting grounds and could just be a navigational error if you were to say head over Morecambe Way rather than Whitby Way um, you would be most likely to see the minke whale the bottlenose dolphin and the harbour porpoise. If we head on to bats, I have to admit that it's not my area of speciality. However, there are a large number of people in this country who are massively knowledgeable on this group and they are tend to be very committed to bats, their conservation protection and also in educating people about bats you have got quite a wealth of bat specific training courses out there and um, the Bat Conservation Trust is probably the best provider of those um, as alongside the Mammal Society in terms of quality. They're unique in that they are our winged mammals. They are all legally protected and a license is required to disturb or handle them and quite intensive training is um, required to get those licenses. Many of our species have suffered quite significant decline in the 20th century and it's put down to uh, being the result of human activity and rather than being direct persecution it's an indirect effect. So we're thinking about things like habitat loss, the disruption of insect food availability, so say the increase in, in the use of pesticides, um, the disruption of their usual roosting habitats, so um, the development of uh, barns, disused barns into housing and also increased urbanisation and the artificial lighting that goes with that. It also seems that wind turbines can also put pressure on po populations and it's thought that the bats are drawn to the turbine um, using it as a navigational feature and rather than the bats colliding with the turbine um, it's actually thought that the change in air pressure can cause internal injuries for the bats. It does, in terms of good news, appear that conservation action is working and although the population numbers have not fully recovered 
bat numbers do seem to have increased across the species. Although they're distinguishable by appearance, um, their speed and their nocturnal behaviour make identification visually near on impossible. Bats do use echolocation for hunting and each species tends to use a particular frequency and that is usually your main form of identification of bats to species level. The advance in technology around bat meters actually means that bat meters are probably a little bit more easily um, used or purchased by general members of the public. You can also get now bat meters that will plug into you say a tablet or your phone and they will not only record the sound of the echolocation but they will also tell you which species it is and can also perform other data analysis. If we go through the bat species that we're likely to find here we're looking at the pipistrels, the Dorbenton's bat, the Natura's bat and the brown long-eared bat as the main species that you're likely to find in this area. Having said that you can be expected to on occasion come across the Alcatho bat, Whiskered bat, Brant's bat, the Lysler's bat and the Nocturne bat within the Yorkshire Dales. If we start with the Pipistrels, they are a group of small bats. They're probably the ones that you are most likely to see. Visually, they're very similar to each other and in terms of physical differences, we're looking at very subtle things so whether they have got hair on the tail membrane we also look at the uh, the cell um, uh, between the elbow and the fifth digit and also penis color in order to tell the difference so mainly we're looking at sound so we've got the common pipistrel a soprano pipistrel and then the theseus pipistrel the common and soprano pipistrels are between 3.5 and 4.5 centimetres long and they usually have a wingspan of about 19 to 24 centimetres. The Nithusius is bigger at 4.6 to 5.5 centimetres and a wingspan of 22 to 25 centimetres. The Nithusius is less common and has a population estimate at 16,000. The common Pipistrel is the least fussy out of them about habitat. The soprano is more associated than the common with wetlands and the Nathusius seems to prefer woodland, parkland, farmland um, and will make use of areas around larger rivers and lakes. They all tend to hibernate between October and April. The Dorbenton's bat primarily hunts over still or slow moving water. It flies very distinctively, very low over the surface of the water in order to predate on the insects that are just above the surface of the water. It's quite a small bat, um, about the same size as the Nathusius pipistrel. They hibernate December to April but will sometimes emerge to feed in milder conditions. The Natura's bat is about four to five centimetres in length and it has an S-shaped calcar. This is essentially where their big toe supports the membrane that then joins the tail. It's usually found foraging around the woodland edges um, and water bodies. It's less often found around arable farmland or pasture but it will visit cow sheds because of the flies that are usually hanging around there. It hibernates November to April and can emerge up to an hour after sunset. The brown long-eared bat, visually quite instantly recognisable with these large brown long ears and the, the ears are usually quite close together on the head. It has a slow and fluttering flight pattern and it's usually found in deciduous woodland. It hibernates November to April but can emerge to feed if the night temperature is 4 degrees or over. It doesn't usually go very far from its roost. It 
hand has roosts that are very close together or will actually use the same roost throughout the entire year. This batch population decline was put down to a change in farming practices, um, in particular the conversion of barns to houses and the use of pesticides in roof areas and they predominantly roost in roof areas. Population numbers are currently believed to be stable. The current population estimate is 245,000 versus the Natteris and Orbentans bat whose populations are thought to be around 150,000. The other species that are found in the Yorkshire Dales, although not quite as commonly as the previous species we've just spoken about, are Brant's bat, Whiskered bat and Alcatho bat. So we've got a picture of a Brant's bat, Whiskered bat and the alcatho bat. Now these are usually found as the, uh, sorry, known as the wab group and um, they're three of the most regularly found myotis species. They are well known to be difficult to tell apart physically and their call is also difficult to detect. The calls, if detected, offer little difference in identification to a species level, leaving in-hand identification as the only reliable method. And even then, DNA analysis is often required when you're looking at juveniles. The British population of Brants and Whiskered bats is thought to be um, 30,000 and 40,000 respectively, whereas the Alcatho population is unknown and it's assumed that Alcatho bats are actually quite rare. The nocturals are tree roosters, but they hunt in, ver in a variety of habitats. They hibernate December to March and are the earliest to emerge in the summer, so they often come out well before sub sunset. Their population est is estimated at 50,000, and it's very closely related to the Lysolus bat. So let's have a look at the Lysolus bat. Um, the Lysolus bat is smaller, it has longer fur and often has a paler ear at the edge of the ear surface. It's also typical to be flying higher in direct um, pathways, just like the nocturnal bat. It feeds over pasture, so especially cattle pasture, um, woodland edges, parkland and water's edges. Um, and they tend to avoid hunting in urban areas, but they will hunt under street lights. So they sort of, in a hawkish motion, will predate on, on moths and some of the insects underneath the light and attracted to the street light. Its population in Britain is thought to be 9,000. Moving on to the insectivores, we're looking at not a terribly big group, but um, in terms of us actually finding them within North Yorkshire, there's only two that you are unlikely to find, and that is the lesser white tooth shrew and the greater white tooth shrew. So the lesser white tooth shrew or the silly shrew um, is found in sillies, uh, the silly isles, and the greater white tooth shrew um, or the house shrew is only found in Ireland. Both of these shrews tend to typically have hairs that stick out at almost right angles on their tail. If we have a look first at the hedgehog, the hedgehog is legally protected. It was once widespread, but it has been um, quite a drastic population decline. The hedgehog makes quite a large number of sniff snuffling, grunting and snorting noises. Um, particularly while it's hunting. It will screech uh, or give quite a very loud high-pitched squeal if it is in distress. They are actually surprisingly mobile, so they will mainly shuffle along whilst foraging, uh, but will, as quite often some people say, pick up their skirts and run if needs be. Um, they do actually have quite unexpectedly long legs. Other than that, they are very distinctive in their appearance with quite a long snout and um, the spines covering them. That ability to roll up into a ball and use those spines as protect 
section is um, very particular to the hedgehog. They can climb and they do actually swim very well as well. They do often die in ponds, but this is less because they can't swim and more because they then actually can't get out of the pond. Um, and then they will get exhausted and they'll drown. So there's been a little bit of a movement to try and encourage people who have ponds in their garden to put, say, a ladder or a selection of rocks in order to give the hedgehog something to climb up and out of the water. They tend to stick to areas with low cover and will make use of a wide range of habitats, including suburban gardens, they eat predominantly invertebrates such as beetles, caterpillars and worms and they will eat what they come across including slugs although they do tend to particularly like worms. They are mainly nocturnal in their behaviour. They hibernate November to March in nests or disused rabbit holes and litters are born usually in June and those litters are about four to six young. The young are referred to as hoglets, piglets or kittens. And if we then go back to what I said right at the beginning, the decline in the population is thought to be around 50% since the 1990s. It's attributed to habitat loss and fragmentation. So by which mean things like poor hedgerow management that would have acted as sheltered corridors between habitats that they use. Flooding, pesticides and in particular slug pellets and the use of garden strimmers, uh, strimmers are also thought to be um, something that has, has caused such a decline. It's at the moment, population-wise, thought to be about a million hedgehogs in this country. There are also the issues of car deaths, so quite a lot of hedgehogs killed on the road. And there is an increase in badger predation as badger population has increased as well. It's sort of a case with hedgehogs as being no one thing, predominantly being the main issue for hedgehogs in terms of their population. But all of those pressures together is definitely an issue for the hedgehog. At the same time, there have been issues with their invasion or introduction to offshore islands. So whereas in this country, we're worried about the population of hedgehogs, we've then got them being considered as invasive species on our offshore islands. They are able swimmers uh, to the point at which they can sometimes swim to some of the closer islands. Um, but it is also known that they were introduced to uh, some of the islands, such as Shetland. They will opportunistically predate on eggs and they are causing issues for ground nesting birds, in particular the coastal species that are known to have strongholds on our offshore islands. Hedgehogs will readily visit gardens and they can be encouraged through the leaving of cat or dog food. People used to leave out bread and milk, but there has been a bit of a recent campaign to educate against this as hedgehogs are actually lactose intolerant and the indigestible nature of milk can actually lead to the death of our hedgehogs. The common shrew is probably uh, an animal that cat owners see quite frequently. It's quite a ferocious little hunter of small invertebrates and they themselves seem to actually be distasteful to most other predators other than barn owls and tawny owls which quite often means that you're likely to see them dead on say path edges um, or in fields because they will be killed but then left uneaten on the ground. They're usually up to about 8.5 centimetres in length. They're smaller than the water shrew but bigger than the pygmy shrew and the tail is about 60% of the head and body length. The tail is often hairy in younger individuals as well. They have a brown coat where the above um, is brown 
and the below the belly side is a whitish color but it actually appears to be three tones so it's quite a gradual change between the brown on uh, the back of the animal to the lighter whitish brown pale underside it's found in many habitats with dense vegetation and it can also be seen any time of uh, the day it has crepuscular tendencies which means that although it is active throughout a 24-hour period it tends to have a sort of peak in activity around dawn and dusk they are actually disproportionately loud for their size they make a very high pitch squeak um, and because they're quite aggressive in nature you can quite often hear them um, having little spats as you walk along um, and if you've got areas of long grass next to you you'll hear them in there they breed between April and September typically have litters of about four to eight young they're actually highly promiscuous and will produce up to four litters a year and the male's involvement is merely at um, conception they, they don't actually raise the young together at all. They will live up to two years, the common tree. Um, they are extremely territorial and aggressive and although they're active throughout 24 hours a day, they're known to typically forage for an hour and then rest for an hour or sleep for an hour and then repeat this. And when they sleep, they tend to take shelter in leaf litter or in other animal burrows. The pygmy shrew is the smallest terrestrial mammal in Britain and it has a maximum length of six and a half centimetres. Its tail, however, is quite fat and is proportionately long at about 80% of its body length, um, although the one in the picture is missing its tail. It uses a wide range of habitats, is widespread and is thought to make use of more damper places than the common stream so it has an estimated population of 8.6 million versus the 42 million of the common stream it also predates on smaller vertebrates but it has a preferred size of around two to six millimeters in terms of its prey it spends more time than the common tree above ground and it's also thought to be more diurnal in its habits than the common tree it doesn't hibernate, but that's mainly because it doesn't often live long enough um, and it shelters or nests under logs and under stones. Its breeding season is April to October. Litters are usually four to six young and they have similar breeding habits to the common tree. It's also territorial, but because of its smaller population, it's less likely to run into other individuals, which would then lead to aggressive encounters. The water shrew is larger and darker in colour with almost black or black fur on its back and uh, a very, very clear line between that and the whiter belly fur. Although it's not unheard of for there to be... Um, a completely black coat. It has a fringe of hairs on its tail and on its feet and it's found on the banks of both streams and ponds. It's the only one of our shrews that will readily swim and hunt underwater. It's highly buoyant and actually has to leap in order to dive under the water. It's mainly nocturnal and its diet as well as the aquatic invertebrates will include amphibians and fish. They're quite noisy with a shrill squeak. They breed April to September, has one or two litters of up to 13 young and it lives for about 18 months. The population is believed to be in decline mainly due to habitat loss and pollution and it's thought that the current population is around 1.9 million. The mole is uh, well known but rarely seen alive. Moles live in a system of tunnels and usually only surface if the ground is too hard to bury through or if it's waterlogged. 
it's fair moves in both directions so by which I mean if you say were to stroke your pet cat or dog um, if you stroke it in one direction it feels very smooth and then you know when you're stroking your dog in the opposite direction but you should get sort of resistance with the fur and you don't get that with the fur of the mole and the reason for this is that it then allows it to reverse and move very easily and freely through its tunnels in both directions. It has highly adapted spade like front feet and despite common belief it can actually see quite well. They eat invertebrates but it really really likes worms and the worm makes up most of its diet. They can often form larders of worms stored for later consumption so they'll kill the worm and then put it in its larder and up to 1200 worms have actually been found in single larders of just one mole's larder. Mole hills are the spoil heaps from the burrowing so obviously they've got to get rid of the soil from uh, in some location or another. They I tend to avoid sandy and highly acidic soils. They'll defend their burrows aggressively um, and then when it comes to mating males will extend their burrows into the territories of nearby females through uh, smell and sound. Um, the females will have litters of three to four young. They'll make their way um, to a new territory about five to six weeks old having spent the, the previous time underground with their mum. Despite near constant persecution for centuries, the population of moles seems to be untouched by this and is thought to be around 31 million individuals. Although, because of their subterranean nature, it's quite difficult to estimate exactly. The next family is quite a small family, the leg moths and of those three species, the ones that you're most likely to see in our area are actually the non-native species. So our native species is the mountain hare. Um, it's a small, legally protected species and its range is pretty much restricted to the Scottish Highlands and Ireland. So there's an overall population of 360,000 but there's a population of about 10,000 in the Peak District. If we look at the rabbit, it's originally from Spain and Portugal and was introduced by the Normans. It was originally kept by them in managed burrows for food and fur um, and it's widespread now, um, extremely common. It is quite adaptable, although it does prefer habitats with access to shorter vegetation that they graze on. They can reach about 50 centimetres in length and they have brown or grey brown fur. Um, you do occasionally get a melanic presentation, so an all black rabbit, which I know quite a few people will mistake for escaped pets, but it is actually a naturally occurring colouring of our wild rabbit. Is one of the most seen mammals in this country um, and that's probably because its current population estimate is about 38 million so there's an awful lot of them. They do tend to be less fearful of humans or reliant on the fact that they can run away to their burrows pretty quickly so it's probably all of those things that mean that they are quite readily seen. Rabbits do actually have a significant impact on our country's ecology as well as the appearance of the affected landscapes um, so the burrowing nature quite often damages the site not just in appearance and it, the fact that it looks a little bit unsightly but that actually it can cause problems um, across that site. They often overgraze areas and where populations are large they can cause significant changes to the soil conditions so um, they increase soil nutrients so that there are then changes in the vegetation. They're listed under the Pest Act of 1954. So owners of land are actually required to control rabbit populations. They be breed very readily, which probably leads to the whole saying um, at it like rabbits. 
Female rabbits are capable of producing a litter of three to seven young or kittens each month. In an attempt to control the population, in 1953, myxomatosis was introduced to this country. Myxomatosis is a pox virus. It's naturally occurring in the species um, in the greater sense. So the tapiti of South and Central America and bush rabbits of North America. It is actually fatal to the European rabbit that you find. It was actually intentionally released in Europe and Australia um, for the elimination of rabbits. So it's hoped that it would eliminate the entire population of rabbits. This clearly failed, but it does offer some population control. There's no cure or treatment for myxomatosis. Pet rabbits are vaccinated, but even vaccinated pets can get it if they're exposed to the uh, pox virus, which would most likely be to close proximity to wild populations. Um, and that's because the vaccine is not 100% uh, effective. The pox is spread through direct touch between animals, um, as well as the movement of ticks, fleas and mites. The European brown hare is sighted less, less often than the rabbit. Um, it is legally prote protected, but it's actually quite common. It's believed that they were introduced in the Iron Age, but we know that they were definitely introduced before the time of the Romans. It was most likely brought over here from the Netherlands. The hair is larger than the rabbit with a body length of 50 to 70 centimetres and its fur is more of a reddish colour with yellow flecks. Its coat can often look a little bit shabby and this is possibly because its, its coat doesn't necessarily lay as smooth and flat as the coat of a rabbit. It has very distinctive long ears um, and again distinctive black tips on the end of those ears and they have quite large powerful hind legs and it's those hind legs which power the high speeds that the hare can reach so it's being recorded to reach speeds of 45 miles per hour. It grazes grasses all year round and will also eat herbs and some tender agricultural crops and like the rabbits um, it will eat its own droppings to extract even more nutrients from them. They like open areas so they're more associated with arable land than pastoral land. Um, mainly nocturnal, nocturnal or crepuscular in their nature and they'll spend the day in shallow depressions in the ground and those are known as forms. So unlike the rabbit they ha don't have extensive burrows um, and in terms of their speed and their ability to run that's where that comes into play so they can't make a short dash for cover in their burrows the only way of escaping prey is to outrun them they're mainly solitary and if you see boxing hares in march, it, march it's actually usually a female fending off a male um the females are in estrus for just a day a month so the males will guard females quite closely it's up to three litters of about four leverets on average born per year to a hare. The young are left from birth in one of the thorns and then the adult hare will return at times to, to feed while they're still suckling. The population decline in, in, in the hare has been attributed to farming intensification, um, which also includes cereal monocultures. So I said before that it tends to be associated with arable rather than pastoral land. So it will feed on the more tender crops when they're younger, but it does need that mix of different kinds of plants to get the nutrients it needs. So monocultures, pesticides will also on occasion poison the hair um, and also death by machinery. So the defence mechanism of the um, leverets is to just stay very, very still in those forms and stay undetective. And that doesn't lend itself very well to when you've got a massive combine harvester going over a, uh, an area of land because that leveret will not move. And then it will quite often get caught up in the machinery and uh, won't survive that. 
Currently, the population estimate is 817,000. Our next family are the wild horses. And wild horses were actually present until about 9,000 years ago. We now have breeds, some of which are considered ancient, that are free ranging or in the case of modern day definitions considered wild. So although they seem wild, to some degree they are all usually managed populations to one extent or another. There is actually now a concern for many of these ancient and traditional breeds because they are in fact declining in numbers um, and that's partly to do with the fact that you know change in farming practices means that we tend to use machinery over uh, horsepower in terms of agricultural practices so there's not anywhere near as much need for these animals in terms of working animals so it's really only leisure that you would keep these horses. Ponies are though now used in conservation efforts so um, they're hardy grazers and they also move about a site and graze differently from the way in which cows and sheep will move around and graze a site. A good local example is the use of Exmoor ponies on Malantan and Malantan is a, a raised bog and it's also a triple SI site but the, the ponies are managing that site in terms of vegetation. Again, unsurprisingly, there's not that many seals in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, both our native seals are legally protected and your best bet for seeing seals is in Yorkshire, in North Yorkshire, is Ravenscar. Um, so it's a rocky headland and home to a colonies of both the common and the grey, grey seals. They come ashore to pop and that's your most likely sighting time. Common seals usually pop between June and July whereas the grey seals usually pop in late October, beginning of November. The last family is quite a large one, especially if you consider that not very many individuals on this list are species that you will not find in our neck of the woods in the Yorkshire Dales. If we very quickly look at the species that you're not likely to find here, we've got at the top the Glisglis or the edible dormouse, which is protected despite being a non-native species. They were introduced to Tring in 1902 when some escaped from a private collection there and they're still pretty much restricted to that area. The Orkney or common vole has a range from Spain to central Siberia but in Britain it's restricted to Guernsey and five of the Orkney Islands. The harvest mouse was once much more common but it's declined due to the use of combine harvesters, pesticides which reduce the food availability and the population is estimated at about 1.5 million currently. The majority of its established range is in the southeast of the country or if you were to draw a line from the, the southeast Wales to the North York Moors it's kind of in that area there um, southward of that line. It's the smallest UK rodent and because of this it can actually often be overlooked in surveys where they're looking at the population size of particular species. The yellow necked mouse is quite a large and feisty mouse. It's, it's ranges in the southeast and the east of England within which it's actually quite widespread but it it's not really found in this particular area. I should say as well, it's, it is also found in Wales. They are considered generally uncommon but localised species. So within their range area, you'll get sort of pockets of good population sizes of the yellow necked mouse. Other than size, so it is quite larger than the wood mouse, you can also distinguish it by its yellow neck which is where it gets its name. So it's got a band of yellow fur underneath the throat um, on a, an otherwise white underside to its body. They prefer long established deciduous woodlands with lots of dead wood and quite a diverse understory. 
Next, we've got the black rat or the sheep rat, ship rat, which was introduced from the Indian subcontinent. And um, it's, it's nicknamed the ship rat. Uh, it comes from the fact that it's quite often associated with uh, humans and sailing and you would find a large proportion of them around the, the old docks and, and on the boats that used to be used. Obviously, hygiene has improved quite a lot over the, the last few centuries. Um, the main kind of historical impact of this animal is the fact that it was the carrier of the fleas and the fleas were then the vector of the bubonic plague. So quite an interesting relationship with, with human history. It is smaller than the brown rat, but it's also more agile. So it's more capable of, of moving around. Not that the brown rat isn't particularly agile, but the black rat is better. Having been eradicated from Lundy in 2005 and the Outer, Outer Hebrides more recently, it's, it's thought now to only remain on Lambay Island off the coast of Ireland. Um, not all black rats are black. So size, body shape and the, the tail, ears and eyes are the, the key things for its identification from the brown rat. The last one on our list is the Eurasian beaver and it is a British native species that was hunted to extinction and it was hunted for its fur and oil that comes from sacks near the base of its tail and though that oil was used in perfumes and as a medicinal remedy. Although it's very distinctive on land so it's quite a large size it's got webbed feet and it's got a very distinctive wide flattened tail in water it can actually quite easily be confused with an otter or a mink it is now recognized that beavers play a vital role in habitat management so there are active and successful reintroduction programs taking place these are currently in Scotland, Devon, Cornwall and in Kent. Um, there have also been some sightings across Wales. So of the species that you're actually likely to see uh, in the Yorkshire Dales, we'll start off with the red squirrel, which is our native squirrel, but it has been recovering from quite serious decline. It is legally protected and there are a good number of conservation efforts to either maintain populations of red squirrels or to encourage them to uh, areas of range extension. The cause of its decline and the role of the grey squirrel is something that is quite hotly debated, although it does seem that the main issue for the red squirrel is habitat destruction and then the presence of the grey just makes matters a whole lot worse for them. The grey is bigger and more adaptable and when in the same area the greys will often thrive and put pressure on the reds in terms of competition for food. On top of this the greys carry a pox virus which they tend to be more resilient to and the reds just cannot fend off. The unfortunate truth now is that if you want your population of red squirrels to thrive then you cannot have greys active in the same area. The Reds are starting to move south from their Scottish strongholds and there have been sightings across the Dales and the best place to see Red Squirrels uh, in our area is at Snay's Home and Ingleborough Estate in Clapham. They have a very distinctive appearance in terms of differentiating them from the Grey Squirrels. So they have um, distinctive ear tusks and chestnut red fur Although this can have elements of, of grey and black within it, you can see that the um, main fur colour is, is this chestnut brown. They have white belly fur and their tail is um, bushy but tends to have a more wispy appearance. They're smaller, slimmer and lighter on their feet than the grey squirrels. They prefer carnivorous woodlands but they can also survive in deciduous woodlands. Uh, or say a mix of the two. They build their nests in the canopy and they feed on nuts, seeds, berries, bark, uh, sap and on fungi as well. They are diurnal in behaviour so they're active during the day and they're actually active all during the year so they don't hibernate. 
their breeding season is February to April and then they will also breed from July to September and during this period they'll have litters of one to six kids. Their current population is 140,000 and about 75% of that population is still in Scotland. The grey squirrel was introduced in North America and that introductory date is known to be between 1876 and 1929. It spread all over England and into Wales and Scotland and it was also introduced to Ireland. It can have a significant amount of brown colouring to its fur um, with a lighter colour on its belly. Um, it can also be very, very dark, almost black and this dark black colouring is becoming quite common in Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire. Um, so you're less likely to see that, that dark colouring up here. They are present in the Dales, but it does seem to be quite locally common. So it does seem to be absent from, from some villages and then present in others. The grey squirrel will build quite conspicuous rays from leaves in the tree canopy and it's usually at about six metres above the ground. They are arboreal but they are quite agile on the ground as well and they often visit the ground to bury their, their caches of food uh, quite often in lawns and in flower beds and places that you'd probably rather they wouldn't dig. Like the red squirrel they breed February to April and then again in July to September and they also have similar sized litters Although they are not necessarily immune to the squirrel pox virus, they are much, much better at fending it off. Um, and as well as putting pressure on the red squirrels, they can also cause significant habitat damage to trees. This habitat damage is not necessarily just restricted to the trees, but, but also the woodland environment as a whole. And it is thought that they are having an effect on the hazel dormouse as well and those populations. So the current population of grey squirrels is 2.6 million. Next down the list we've got the hazel dormouse which is actually not very common in North Yorkshire although it is found. It's a legally protected species and was actually extinct in Yorkshire along with actually most of the rest of the country. They have been reintroduced, there were two phases of reintroduction, so one in 2008 and one in 2016, and this was two, two small areas of woodland in Wensleydale. There was then following this project to create a three mile wide habitat for the dormouse, and they wanted to achieve this through connecting these two woodlands to a third woodland with wildlife corridors. Despite these programs, its population of 45,000 is predominantly still in the central and eastern area of England and Wales. In terms of appearance, they have very orangey fur and quite a long bushy tail in comparison to other mice. They are quite small um, and that almost makes their large black eyes um, and long whiskers look even larger and longer. They use their tail for climbing and also have quite long toes which again they'll use for climbing, very good for gripping the stems of plants. It's mainly arboreal so spends most of their time uh, climbing through the vegetation in the understory and shrub layer of deciduous woodlands and hedgerows as well. It's known to like ancient woodlands and also to have a preference for a network of woodlands. Um, so specific woodland areas that are then joined with connecting hedgerows. And it also quite likes coppice woodlands, especially hazel coppice. Some of the important plants for the dormouse are oak, sweet chestnut, hazel, bramble and honeysuckle. It eats flowers and pollen in the summer months and then fruits, berries and seeds in the autumn and then it hibernates in the winter. Um, it will also eat insects. Its breeding season is quite late or close to the mark in terms of when they're going to be hibernating and it usually has one litter around August 
and occasionally a second in September. Litters tend to be about four to five young. The males are territorial during the breeding season, but um, they tend to be quite social, it seems otherwise, or maybe not particularly aggressive towards each other if they come across each other. Um, to the point which, so they hibernate in October to May, which is quite a long time to hibernate, and they'll hibernate in a nest on the ground, but they will actually sometimes share their nest areas. Now, it does seem I uh, forgot to move the slide along, so um, this list of the main facts does summarise what we've just been through. So, um, coat colour, that, that bushy tail, and its association with ancient woodlands and hedgerows. Um, you can see here where it lists its body length and weight that, as we said at the beginning, they are quite small. If we move on, our next one as we go down the list is the bank vole and the bank vole is very common. Its population is estimated at 23 million. Their population tends to fluctuate every three to five years. The voles are similar in appearance to mice in size and shape. However, they have smaller eyes and ears and a shorter tail and they also have a less pointing nose I like to think that their face looks a little bit like a teddy bear. They're terribly cute. Um, it's almost sickening. Uh, the fur of the bank vole is a reddish brown colour with a more greyish or creamy tinge to the fur that you find on its belly. They're active day and night but are more active during the day. They tend to keep quite close to the ground when they move to avoid being seen. They also use the network of tunnels made um, maybe slightly into the ground, underneath the leaf litter, but also in the base of the long grasses of the habitats that they use. They also will burrow into the ground um, and you, you might just find sort of shallow tunnels in this area. They are solitary, but they also have home ranges and these home ranges do tend to overlap slightly. They breed during March to October and females tend to mate with dominant males within their areas. They can give birth to a litter of four or around four young every month. Bank voles prefer woodland areas but they will also make use of hedgerows and essentially it's just areas of quite thick colour and scrub. You will also, also find them on, on marshy ground. It tends to eat buds seeds, leaves and fruit from the, the plants that you get in its territory but it will also predate on small insects. It can carry forage food in, in small cheek pouches um, so it's got little storage pouches in its cheek kind of like a hamster and it will hide food in its tunnels that it uses to, to go across its home range they will also forage for food higher up in the trees and shrubs um, as well as uh, looking for stuff on the ground. So quite small body length, we said that it's quite widespread um, and again those shallow burrows that it uses to move around its sites and this is actually uh, a characteristic that is quite common in all of the, the smaller rodents in terms of the ways in which they move across their, their habitat. Field roll is our next on the list so it's also known as the short tail vole which funnily enough is because it has a very short tail so it's similar to the bank vole um, its tail is only half of its body length rather than two thirds its coat is more of a grey brown colour rather than the reddish fur of the bank vole and its ears tend to be even less obvious or even less visible than those of the bank vole Again, the short tail vole tends to use um, a network or quite an intricate system of runways, tunnels and nests uh, in the leaf litter and, and at the base of the grass tussocks. Its preferred habitat is long grassland and it doesn't tend to use woodland and hedgerows so you don't often get overlap in the habitat with the bank vole although they will use habitats that are like 
right next to each other if you've got a mosaic of habitats within an area. They hold small territories and they feed on grass, shoots and roots. They are active at all hours, although they do tend to be more nocturnal in hot weather and then switch to being a bit more diurnal in the winter. They breed from March to October and they can have up to seven litters uh, each breeding season with about one to eight young in each litter. They are very promiscuous and females will mate with whichever dominant male is around. They are very common and the population is thought to be around 75 million. Although the population is cyclical, again over about four year period, similar to that of the fluctuations of the bank vole population. And again, like the bank vole, they uh, will live for about the same amount of time. So that's about 12 to 18 months. The water vole is quite a large vole and only slightly smaller than the, the rats. As such, it can actually be mistaken for the rat and is sometimes referred to as the water rat. Um, and along those lines, it's well known character Ratty from The Wind in the Willows is actually a water vole and not a rat. Um, it has very characteristic vole features, so small eyes and ears, um, a small fairy tail, and its fur colour in the water vole actually can vary from light brown to a very, very dark brown or, or nearly black. The water vole is a very able swimmer and it lives in the banks of slow flowing rivers and it will also make use of march, marshes and marshland um, so it, it's very much associated with the water hence its name it eats grasses reeds sedges and all other types of vegetation that it will find in the water the water vole is active at all hours and throughout the year albeit less so in the winter Interestingly, where it's found alongside the rat, it tends to be more active during the day, whereas the rat tends to be more active at night. The vole, the water vole will breed from March to September. And interestingly, it's either going to form a monogamous pair. So where populations are quite small, they do tend to form these monogamous pairs. Um, whereas where you've got quite large populations, they tend to be a bit more promiscuous. So um, like our other old species, perhaps selecting the dominant male within the area to breed with. The female can have up to five litters of about six young each year. Um, the young don't breed or tend to breed until the following year. Um, voles have a life expectancy of up to two years. So the water vole lives um, a little bit longer than its smaller counterparts. They are legally protected and this is mainly down to the fact that they were common until the 90s when their numbers suffered a massive and very very steep decline. This was put down to habitat destruction, agricultural development, pollution and also the American mink's introdu introduction to two areas. Um, its current population is at 875,000. So there have been a successful set of reintroduction programmes and specifically, locally, um, that successful reintroduction programme is up at Malintan. Um, after it was confirmed that there were no longer mink in the area, they had a reintroduction that I think was either late 2015 or in 2016 with um, the first initial release and then there's been subsequent releases. And as far as I know, that population is still doing quite well. Next, we have the wood mouse and the wood mouse is associated with woodlands, but it will also make use of gardens, road verges, hedges, um, arable fields, heathland, moorland and wetlands, so it is quite adaptable. In our area, they particularly like the dry stone walls, which they'll use as shelter as well as an area to forage. It's one of the UK's most abundant mammals with a population estimate of between 38 and 140 million um, 
and that range sort of depends on if it's pre or post breeding season. They have a brownish colour to their fur uh, with a whitish belly colouring in terms of their, their fur colour. They can have a yellowish brown area above the hind legs. It has quite a pointed nose but very large eyes and large ears in proportion to the head size. They have quite a varied diet, so they will eat nuts, seeds, berries, fungi, moss, moss, plant galls and insects. They are active all year, although mainly at night, and they live in a series of burrows and tunnels which is passed through um, each generation. So um, the, the tunnels will then be taken on and used by subsequent generations. They climb in trees and bushes and they move quite erratically. So they'll leap and jump around their habitat. And this works as a prey tactic. So in order to make them harder for predators using sound to locate them um, and, and pinpoint where they actually are. So if you consider their nocturnal behavior, if you then think about the kind of predators that are gonna be out nocturnally, they're mainly using sound to pinpoint exactly where their prey is uh, particularly a good example is the barn owl listening out for that um, small mammal to be moving around so that erratic behavior and the movement of the noise all over the place makes it more difficult for the owl to hone in and and locate them the wood mouse will breed march to october typically and they can produce up to four litters a year of between four and seven youngs a young the females start breeding very quickly and they are solitary with overlapping ranges and they are highly promiscuous so again the females are likely to breed with dominant males within the area the house mouse is actually introduced albeit in the bronze age and it's believed to have originated in the middle east it's close closely associated with humans as in human habitation and because of this it can be seen as quite serious pest. The estimated population in this country at the moment is 5.4 million. In terms of appearance it's quite greyish in colour and rather sleek in appearance. They were domesticated and can be found in a whole range of different fur colourings as pet mice. So just a few of those here. So if you purchase a pet mouse in a pet shop, then it will be uh, must domesticus. If we have a look at its main features, we'll carry on looking at our wild variety. They are mainly found in buildings, wasteland and around livestock. They can't really compete with the yellow necks and the wood mouse. So you don't tend to get an overlap in terms of population. It will feed on pretty much whatever it can find, although grain is its main staple, um, along with invertebrates and wild seeds, uh, which also form quite a large amount of its diet. It also has quite a particular habit of nibbling grain, but need not actually eating all of it. So it remains, uh, leaves the remains of that grain and the husk of the grain as well. It is active all year, usually nocturnal, and it lives in holes in the buildings or it can burrow into the ground and usually forms quite a complex system of passageways. Its home range size can vary depending on its habitat and also the population density within that area. They will breed throughout the year and uh, will have litters of five to 10 young and the young become sexually mature at about six weeks of age. What tends to be less typical of the other mice is that the females will pull litters in communal nests and then also nurse each other, other's young. So that's not something that you typically find in our other mice species. This animal will sort of vary its aggression towards other, other groups uh, depending on its density. So it is aggressively territorial at low density and its aggression declines as densities increase. The brown rat is not native 
It was first recorded in 1720 and probably came from Central Asia. Rats actually have quite a bad reputation and they can be found in large numbers and can also carry diseases. However, saying that you are never more than about six feet away from a rat is actually an untrue statement. The brown rat is social and they live in groups of typically one male to several fe females and the male will have a harem of females. These groups form territories um, and they then defend those territories. However, their behaviours change depending on density, just like the house mouse. If they are in rural areas where densities are lower, then they tend to be less aggressive. Whereas in urban areas where populations are, are typically quite high, then they are much less tolerant of other groups. And although they live very closely, they don't actually do so harmoniously. They are excellent pests because they are highly adaptable and intelligent, but these qualities also probably explain their domestication and the fact that they make excellent pets. So they will readily form bonds with people and will also learn tricks. And we've got a picture of a pet rat here. And similarly to the house mouse and the domestic form, um, you will get very very wide variety of colours of pet rats and there's also um, a specific breed of pet rat which is known as the Dumbo rats. The, they've bred those rats so the ears are lower than you would typically find um, and a little bit bigger so um, the Dumbo as in elephant so um, interesting development of the species. They readily eat a lot of different things in terms of the fact that they are omnivores and they will eat grains and seeds but in rural areas you know they're likely to make use of all sorts of um, food products that are thrown away in, in rubbish however they can be cautious of a new food and they will often try a little bit first before they return and eat more of it if it, it seems to be okay like foxes, they tend to be more skittish in rural areas, but quite bold in urban areas. And they are mainly, but not exclusively, nocturnal. They don't hibernate and they breed throughout the year. Um, they can produce up to about five litters a year and tend to have litters of average nine young. The male will melt, mate with his harem of females, though it is always the females who tend to the young and raise them. Rats can and often do swim. This, along with their size and general appearance, can lead to them being mistaken for the water vole and vice versa. It is less buoyant than the water vole, so it swims a little bit lower in the water and quite often like lifts its bum, raises its bum up a little bit. The rat, in terms of fur colour, you've got a greyish brown colour to its fur. It has a broad, long tail which is often described as scaly and it, it does look as though it's scaly but it's covered in short hairs and doesn't actually feel scaly at all. It has a pointed large nose and large-ish eyes and ears. They are as broad in their choice of habitat as they are in their fruit foods. They can be found in sewers, rubbish tips, old buildings, alongside railways, as well as a wide range of natural habitats. And people in rural areas quite often have problems with them if they keep chickens, so they're attracted because of the chicken waste and also the chicken food as well. Um, in fact, because of its adaptability, it's actually spread across the world. So the only areas without rats are Antarctica, the Arctic and a few isolated islands and certain conservation areas of New Zealand. They have also managed to get rid of the rat in Alberta, Canada and they continue to quite ferociously defend their border. Um, Australia is absent from rats apart from the east and southeast coast um, so it doesn't have a very large rat population. The UK population, however, is around 10 million. To bring our presentation to a close, and as a little bit of a summary of our small mammals, we've got a little quiz. We have diagrams of the smaller 
mammals highlighting their key features and this is also available as a downloadable handout from the website. As a little bit of guidance to help you, the shrews are included but size wise it does not include the larger small mammals which would be the water bowl or the rats. Um, it also doesn't include the Edinburgh Dormouse. Um, what I would suggest is having a go at guessing which of uh, our small mammals are represented here and you can pause the video and take as much time as you need and then on the next slide we will go through the answers. Okay, so answers to the quiz are as follows. At the top, we've got the common shrew and key identifying features are small eyes, small ears, very pointy nose and the tail being approximately two thirds of its body size. Then we've got the pygmy shrew, so smaller, but also with the small eyes, small ears and the pointy nose. The silly shrew, uh, with the shrew features as we previously gone through but also has um, the sparse long hairs on its tail that sort of stick out almost at right angles and then the water shrew again the narrow pointy prehensile nose small eyes and ears but a very clear line of um, hairs underneath the long tail and also quite a clear line between its main coat colour and uh, the colour of the belly fur. Then harvest mouse, so compact head, large eyes and a long prehensile tail. The yellow necked mouse, large in size, large eyes and ears, has a longer nose and has a long tail, uh, typical of the mice but it has that yellow band of fur around the neck. Then wood mouse, so our mouse features with a clear change between the main coat and the belly fur, but hasn't got that yellow band around the neck. House mouse, again, typical mouse features. So the uh, sharper nose, big ears, big eyes, uh, but has the very similar coat colour all over. Then next down, field vole, the rounded face of the vole with um, the large-ish eye but sort of smaller in comparison to the mouse eye and with small ears, uh, sometimes almost so small that you can't see them. With the field vole, the tail is about a third of the body length. And then bank vole is the next one down, so rounded vole features, but the tail is about two thirds of the body length. The hazel door mouse um, is the last one on here, and it has the mouse like features, but typically a little bit more rounded uh, in the face. So actually facially it's more similar to the vole but it it hangs on to those those mouse features like the large eyes and the long tail only the hazel door mouse has quite a fluffy tail i hope you have enjoyed the video and um, to close i just wanted to say again that despite its length it has only just touched the surface of the ecology and habits of our native mammals and well, our introduced ones as well. There is an accompanying handout to this presentation that can be downloaded from the Stories in Stone website and it covers a range of recommended further reading. This covers mainly research-based publications, so facts and figures about distribution and habitats and the actual habits of these animals but it does also cover some species specific publications that I personally have read. So I know there are more out there and um, it will probably get added to um, once I've read them. I 
would also say that in addition there are some videos that accompany this and so there's one on tracks and signs and there's also one on the identification of the contents of our pellets focusing on small mammals. Thank you very much for listening.